So here we're looking at the Wikipedia page for the Committee of the Whole. The Committee of the Whole is one of the most fundamental central concepts to this whole idea of transparency and to the whole idea of what changed in the 1970s. And what's absolutely amazing is it is left out of almost every study of United States Congress and this massive change that happened inside of the Committee of the Whole in particular. And just to give you an idea of how little it is considered, this is the entire Wikipedia page. And it mostly just talks about how things happen in the Committee of the Whole currently and leaves out entirely the history of the Committee of the Whole and even the history that they have looks completely ridiculous. They have no idea what they're talking about. Now, there's a much better article on it in Congressional Quarterly. So I'm going to run through this really quickly. Committee of the Whole. Senate rules permitted recorded votes on every issue, but the House took most of its votes while sitting as a Committee of the Whole House, where recorded votes were prohibited to speed action by the large body. So don't assume just because Congressional Quarterly says it that it's actually true, but this is much better than the Wikipedia page. Recorded votes were prohibited in the Committee of the Whole. Now here they come up with a reason for it, to speed action by the large body. They're just making that up. The House's non-recorded, okay, completely non-transparent vote practice was patterned after a centuries-old English system. This is very important. So again, we're talking about the British system, which is controlled by this really powerful force called a king. And I want you to think, as we're talking about this, about the really powerful force that we have in the United States of the elites, the very, very rich. Okay, so big, big companies, Google, Coca-Cola, the Koch brothers, etc., all these real powerful forces. And I want you to compare them in power to the king as we talk about this. So, so the House's non-recorded vote practice was patterned after a centuries-old English system whereby members of parliament could hide their individual votes from the king. Okay, sure they could hide them from the people, but the real idea of setting up the Committee of the Whole wasn't to hide the votes from the people, but it was to hide it from this really powerful force. In 1832, the English system was reformed to provide for a public record of votes. So they moved to a transparent set of votes, and then the United States House reform came 138 years later in 1970. And if we assume that the reason is to speed up action by a large body, well, by adding electronic voting, we've actually made things actually quicker. But look how quickly this article actually contradicts itself, right? Parliament would hide their individual votes from the king. And this was crucial because the king, in some ways, resembled a president, right? The king was the executive branch, and when the king wanted to get allocation for funds, he would have to go to parliament to secure the funding for such items. Now, if individual votes of individual members of parliament were transparent, well, then the king could exert his enormous pressure on those individual members to push them to vote the way he wants. So again, we're talking about intimidation, not bribery. Okay, bribery is overrated, it exists, but it's not nearly as powerful as intimidation. The king can now intimidate a single member of parliament. The same relationship we can see between the president and a member of the House of Representatives. Okay, the president, if he can see every single vote, can now push single members to do certain things because, as Lincoln says in the Lincoln movie, president has phenomenal powers. All right, so let's keep moving. The Continental Congress frequently used the Committee of the Whole. Very important, okay? So all the Founding Fathers loved this idea of the Committee of the Whole, and they used it almost precisely in the way it had been used up until 1970. And in 1789, the first Congress adopted a system of rules for the House which provided for a Committee of the Whole. This was the fourth order of business in the House of Representatives. And the Committee of the Whole was where everything happened. Any bill that was put forward, any legislation that was put forward would sit first in the Committee Committee the whole, then it would be spit out to an ad hoc committee, and no one trusted committees because there were too few people in them. Then the committee would write up its own bills, knowing full well it had to go back to the Committee of the Whole. The Committee of the Whole is where legislation died. Things got rejected because if they weren't written clearly, or if there was any dose of corruption in there, it would come back to the Committee of the Whole and the members would vote secretly on it. Secretly meaning, if we don't understand it, no, I don't owe you anything when I vote secretly, so no horse trading, no deal making can happen. You can't trade votes if the voting is done secretly. But again, this is the fourth order of business in something that's not very well covered in American history, that first day in Congress. And again, this was the fourth order of business and the last order of business on the very first day of Congress and likely proposed by Madison himself because he was in the Constitutional Convention, he was in the Continental Congress, and all of them were using Committee of the Whole. And they didn't feel like they needed to flesh out all the rules. These were unspoken rules because they had been using it for so long. Okay, and so here we have this crucial date, 
Okay, I had this back and forth between a famous historian, current historian on Congress, and he wrote me saying, the committee, the whole didn't exist before 1840. That's not true. What happened in 1840 was this unspoken set of rules became codified when a speaker ruled that recorded votes could not be taken in the committee of the whole, and the ruling has been reaffirmed ever since. Okay, so a speaker said then that recorded votes could not be taken, but he said it because they had never been taken. So he took an unspoken rule, made it a spoken spoken rule and affirmed it. And these rules provided that only amendments approved in the Committee of the Whole could be voted upon by the full House. So the Committee of the Whole had the power of rejection, and they were very good at rejecting things. They rejected lots of crappy and poorly written legislation. And once it left the Committee of the Whole, the only thing the full House could vote publicly on was what was approved by the Committee of the Whole. And the Committee of the Whole, again, voted on single lines, single paragraphs, very, very hard to insert corruption into this committee the whole. It really was like the acid bath for corruption. So, as I suggested, amendments rejected in the committee of the whole and not reported to the House by the committee were not considered by the full body and thus no roll call could be taken. So once rejected, fully rejected by the committee of the whole. Once passed, these were tentative votes. Okay, so once passed, it had to be voted on by the full committee. And I love this idea that this is tentative voting. It's secret, but it's tentative. This isn't the final vote. This is secret votes on the amending and the markup process. Okay, and then the congressional quarterly, while well, they get into a little bit the actual rules of the committee of the whole, and they try and make sense of which bills it would actually look at, but this was never codified. And indeed, the Committee of the Whole looked at tons of legislation. All major bills, said the New York Times in the 1970s, were considered in the Committee of the Whole. And it goes into the various ways that people would vote in the Committee of the Whole, and all the different ways had various levels of secrecy. But none of the ways provided for a written record to actually leave the House. So all the transparency that exists in the Committee of the Whole stayed in the House, and even for individual members on some votes, it was hard to tell how other members voted. So it was hard to do trading. And most observers said that people in the galleries who had watched the Committee of the Whole had a really hard time. It was almost impossible to figure out how members voted because they would go up and whisper to the tellers. They would change their vote with the tellers. They would slide in pieces of paper. They would turn their heads from the galleries and make their votes, fully knowing that the gallery was trying to figure out all their votes so they could hold them accountable for a bribe or some level of intimidation. So I'm going to wrap this up here, but it's great to have started this conversation on this very important committee, the most important committee in all of congressional history, and I call it the acid bath for corruption. And it was made ineffectual with the 1970 Legislative Reorganization Act.